started with two classes which were kind of doing quite very basic um, introduction to dynamical systems and we did basic properties of irrational rotations and then uh, Gauss map and continued fractions. Then we had two lectures which we spent really um, going into details of the renormalization procedure for irrational rotations. And we saw uh, this uh, cutting and stacking and inducing uh, tool. And uh, again, my reason, I mean, to, uh, uh, it's kind of for me, it's like the, the, the baby example, the first example of renormalization in dynamics. And it's like one of the simplest entropy zero, maybe the simplest entropy zero dynamical system, the rotation, and the simplest example of renormalization. And um, today it's kind of last day of the week, so I want to kind of, next week we will see more examples of renormalization. It will be completely in some sense, uh, we'll start again from Monday because we have also new people joining, so it will be independent. But we will see again kind of two different examples of renormalization, one geometric and one really more uh, uh, about interval exchanges. And uh, today I just, so we will not use directly today uh, this algorithm, but we will kind of use the philosophy of renormalization again. And in some sense we will see a case which is more general of, mm, and in similar in flavor. But uh, today I wanted to give you some application of what really you can do just with that algorithm. And that's what I'll try to do. But first let me repeat again uh, something I didn't say yesterday maybe. So again, what is the philosophy of this renormalization? I think I'll bug you so much that if one idea you will take away from two weeks of with me is that, yeah, entropy zero dynamical systems, often renormalization is key. Again, what's the philosophy of renormalization? You have a space of systems, of dynamical systems, of a certain type. You have a space of certain dynamical systems. And so the points of this space are dynamical systems, say F. And then you have a map, R, from this space of systems back to itself. And the idea is that you look, you fix a dynamical system you want to study in your space, and you look at the orbit of this dynamical system under the renormalization. So this is the orbit of, so you think of your dynamical system as a point and you have a new dynamical system which is acting on dynamical systems, right? And then uh, the properties, the dynamical features of, of, this, of this orbit the pro from the properties of the, of the dynamics of renormalization, you can infer, often you can infer, you can infer uh, properties of your system. So you are interested in your system, but you renormalize it to understand it. <coughs> and uh, in our case, it's maybe not the deepest case, but let me just uh, see it in our case. In our case, uh, you take the rotation and this renormalization, which is inducing and zooming, gives you, as we saw, the rotation by Gauss to the N of alpha. Sorry, R, if I apply it N times, I see a rotation by Gauss to the N. So what can I tell about, I'm interested in the rotation, what can I tell by studying renormalization? So let me give you an example that you already know. So if uh, uh, the Gauss map maps to zero, if it's eventually mapped to zero, what can I say about my original rotation? Do you remember? Huh? Yes, so if in this case, Actually, you can prove that the induced map is identity. At some point, instead of having an exchange of two intervals, one interval shrinks to zero, and you have an exchange of one interval. And from here, you, you can recover if you want that the rotation is periodic. 
This is the case of rational periodic number. But you can think of it dynamically as my renormalization ends on identity at some point. What if alpha is a fixed point, so a oh, periodic point of the Gauss map of the renormalization? What can you tell me about the rotation in this case? So maybe I'll tell you this. So what, what you see is that when you rescale, you see after n rescaling, you see exactly the same rotation you started with. So this is somehow telling you that R alpha is self-similar. Self-similar in the sense of fractals. So if I zoom at different scales, at smaller scales, I see the same picture than the bigger scale. So this is idea. So eventually, uh, in zero, it's periodic. And uh, renormalization, periodic, means that my map is self-similar. And then what about for typical? For typical alpha, uh, what you see for typical alpha is that the typical orbit of the Gauss map will be, will be uh, Gn of alpha will be in somehow dense, and uh, you can also use that the Gauss map is ergodic. And you can kind of see that uh, different scales will change. So some change sometimes. So the different scales kind of depend on the entries of the continuous fraction. So they will be in some sense random. So you can see in some sense random scales, random scales. But you can use uh, this ergodicity to say how often, how often you see a certain behavior. So this is indeed, uh, for example, a n appears. So you can kind of deduce a lot of information from the property of the Gauss map. So David just shows that you can kind of study, for example, distribution of entries in the continued fraction. And from this, you have very fine information about the behavior of the rotation on different scales, how often you see a certain picture on certain scales. This is the philosophy, OK? <clears throat> but uh, in, uh, in addition to the philosophy that we will see again next week in other contexts, really the tool that I gave you yesterday, we, we, it's actually helpful to prove many things. So let me recall you. We have one tool with four flavors in four versions. So what did we define? We define a procedure to, renormal, to renormalize. So we define uh, a procedure to induce. So I have a, cir a, a, a circle, and I induce on smaller, smaller, smaller intervals around 0. Oh, sorry, uh, I went too fast. OK. And uh, then I defined you an algorithm, an algorithm where you cut from the right and then cut from the left. This is just a picture memory of what we did in the past two lectures. And then we saw that this procedure or this algorithm are related, and they also give you a system of partitions. So for each step, I get the partition of the circle into arcs. And we also saw that these partitions can be visualized in terms of dynamical towers, of so Rocklin or Kakutani's towers. And the algorithm acts as cutting and stacking. So this is just a visual picture to remind you. So we have four different tools, which are just variations of the same tool. And they claim that, now I have a slide where I want to convince you that just with these tools, you can do a lot of interesting mathematics. So this is going to be our sample. And I'll go through the, some of these, uh, the first two, actually, in more in detail. OK, let me tell you some results you can prove using these tools. So this we will do next. So there is a theorem called the tree gap theorem for the rotation, also called Steinhaus theorem. And uh, the proof is very simple using towers. We will do it in a second. And uh, maybe many of you might have heard of the Joachimma inequality. It's, a, it's a inequality about Birkhoff sums over a rotation. And there is a nice proof using towers that I'll try to explain in a second. So these two are classical results about the rotation, which you can prove very nicely with these pictures. But let me go a little bit beyond. Uh, we always treated rotations, but uh, 
there's a whole theory of homeomorphism of the circles or diffeomorphism of the circle. Again, it's a whole different course you can give on them. But uh, uh, in, it's possible to treat uh, homeomorphism and diffeomorphism studying them with renormalization. So this renormalization procedure that we saw for rotation, you can actually, I'll say a few words if I can, you can actually do it for uh, diffeos. And you can use it, for example, to define rotation number through renormalization. And I will tell you later, I have, uh, there are classical results like Boincaré theorem and Hermann results about conjugating a, a diffeo of the circle with the rotation you can prove them using this algorithm. And there is not maybe the more standard proof, but for example, this nice book by Van Strien and De Mello has a whole chapter where they do this algorithm for circle diffuse, really with this point of view of renormalization. And uh, I told you the um, lecture, I had some notes which I had gave as a reference, there's a book, uh, Topics in Algodic Theory by Sinai, and the reason why Sinai is also involved for example, there, he has a paper with Hanin where they give actually a st strengthening of Hermann's result using these partitions for diffeomorphisms. So you can do a lot also more in general about circle diffeos using renormalization. And let me go back to just rigid rotation now. Let's go back to really the rotation. There are still things that people are proving about rotations and even uh, uh, let me tell you two examples where I proved something about rotations using exactly these partitions. And uh, one, I think, uh, so for example, I have a joint work with uh, uh, Sinai that I wrote when I was a PhD student. And uh, this is some limit theorem for Birkhoff sums of non-integrable functions, whatever that is. And it, the, the key in this paper is really to look very carefully at these partitions for the circle. And if someone did the exercise yesterday, I gave you to, to code, code the partition with long, long, right, left, left, long, long. And I, I ask you to check that these words are almost palindrome. So if you read them backward, apart from the first symbol, they are the same. Has anybody tried? No. <laughs> okay, so now I'll tell you this story because it's a funny story. So I, I, did anybody saw online, I put some handwritten notes about the partitions and the renormalization. Have you seen? So those notes I wrote when I was a PhD student, so essentially your age, and Sinai told me, read this book about uh, topics in ergodic theory, understand well this partition. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand these partitions, and I draw all these pictures, and I was trying to draw my picture with nice colors. So my advice, if you, when you study something that is important for your research, or Study it really, really well. So really spend time to understand it fully. And sometimes it really pays off to know some tools really inside out. Because for example, at some point I was playing with this partition and I noticed this uh, symmetry and I said, oh, how curious this is. And it turns out that this symmetry is really key in this paper. So there is a key. So it's useful to know your tools and play with them well. And um, even more funnily, like just la few last year actually, uh, mm, I have, a, oh sorry, I have a postdoc, uh, Michael Bromberg, some of you know him, he's a postdoc in Bristol. And uh, um, we just proved, uh, I will t try to tell you, show you the slide at the end. Uh, we proved something, uh, a theorem called the uh, generalization of this back central limit theorem for rotations. And it, there was an open question by Omri Sarig and Dima Dolgopiat. And uh, the proof is really based on this cutting and stacking of towers, that really for rotation. So, you see, I keep going back to the same tools. So it's good to know your tools well. <laughs> okay, this was just to kind of show off how many things you can do. But let me just uh, uh, show you the first two and maybe say a few words about uh, uh, the rest. So I really want to prove, I want to state and prove the three gap theorem and the Joachim Cox one. And then maybe I'll say a few more things. Okay, so uh, <coughs> okay, so let, let's do, this is the following result, and again, it's called three gap theorem, or Steinhaus theorem. But actually, 
actually, it's been proven over and over and over and over by tons of people because it's kind of not such a strange fact to discover. And everybody who plays with the rotation long enough notices. And so I don't think there is one author. I think there are hundreds of independent proofs and uh, people who noticed it. And you can prove it in many ways. So what is it? So for, for any alpha, I think periodic would be fine too, uh, for any alpha and for any point on the circle and for any n, I'm going to plot the rotation orbit up to n. So consider the initial piece of the orbit, z, r alpha of z, dot, 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 r alpha to the n of z. Change my orbit. So I just plot a finite segment of my orbit. So I say this is my z, and I plot, I plot, I plot, I plot, 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 I plot, uh, whatever, uh, something. And now I have, I don't know, n plus 1. I have n plus 1 points. And I want to look at the gaps. So what are the gaps? So these points are not ordered. So as I, as I apply my rotation, I jump. Uh, I don't follow the order. But I can uh, look at the natural ordering on the circle of these points. And I can look at the distances between neighboring points on the circle. Uh, so, so this is what is called a gap. So a gap is just the distance on the circle, distance between closest to successive to successive points on the circle. Okay. And again, let me stress that unless uh, uh, some special cases. These are not successive in the orbits, but they're just successive in space. So I just look how they, I re reorder them and look at the spacing. And uh, I don't know, you can, you can, I don't know, if you have some an alpha, you can also write it as fractional part. So you can look at fractional part of an alpha, say that this is your an alpha. And then you can look at the minimum between an alpha and uh, uh, k alpha as uh, k ranges between 0 and, uh, and uh, uh, n, and is different than n. And maybe also you want to say that, uh, uh, OK, well, that's fine. Uh, okay. So something like this. You look at the closest neighbors. And uh, the conclusion, well, it's called so you, you could expect if you throw points at random that these gaps could be, in general, would be maybe you distributed in a certain fashion. But in the rotation, well, it's called three gap theorem. Can you guess what the conclusion is? <laughs> there are only three gaps. So there are only three gaps. At most, three gaps. There are only, at most, three gaps. And actually, uh, actually, there are two, there are two, two if and only if n is equal to, uh, two if and only if n is equal to qk for some, for some qk denominator of alpha, denominator of convergence, uh, denominator of alpha. Okay. So there are maybe, OK, two or three. So it's a very, very simple proof. And uh, 
you can see it very clearly in the towers and you can also compute what are the gap lengths and what is the gap frequency and get a lot of information. So let me just pick, as my point, I can pick a zero because in any case, everything is homogeneous, so I can pick zero. And um, what do you want to do? I just want to, oh yeah, so I want to remark that if I look at the sequence QK plus QK minus one, this is uh, monotone, this is increasing. So there exists a unique K such that N is in between QK plus QK minus one and QK plus QK plus one. <coughs> so I'm just saying uh, these uh, numbers are just uh, growing, so my n will, will be between two of them. Okay, I just find the k which uh, picks my n. And now I hope you all did uh, the exercise. The first, if you, any of you who did the first exercise uh, yesterday uh, for my course, I ask you to plot the orbit of zero uh, up to this length, and I ask you to plot the orbit to zero up to that length. Just for curiosity, who has done it? A few people have done it, so I'm not going to do it. If you haven't done it, you have to try or trust me. So if I plot, uh, if I plot uh, the orbit of uh, zero up to n, uh, this is what I want to study. I want to plot these points and see what are the gaps. So there are more points than this and less point than that. So let me see. So let me give you the solution of yesterday thing. If you plot the orbit up to here, what you see is going all, all the way up and then up to here. So these points uh, contain the yellow orbit. So by yellow orbit, I mean this is the orbit of zero. It lies along these towers. And what about if I go further, if I go up to here, then I see all the yellow. And then I start seeing this. I start doing the cutting, right? So, so it's also contained in the red lines. By red, I have to include uh, this everything. Okay. So let me give you an example. Uh, Is it clear what I'm saying? So, well, if you haven't done the exercise, you just have to believe that if you plot the orbit up to the QK plus QK minus one, you're here. If you keep going, you actually will see, uh, will get up to here. And I'm somewhere in between. My orbit is somewhere in between. So, for example, uh, my orbit could be, let's make this bigger. My orbit could be like this. For example, in another color, maybe blue. Can I try to put it back? Would that be good? Is it enough? Should I? Am I? Am I? Okay. Let me check the microphone experts. Am I still okay? <laughs> So, so what is my orbit until n? So this in blue, I will draw the orbit until n. It could be it's like this. It has to go up to here. So sorry. This is the k, k towers. These are the towers k 
okay? And this is QK, and this is QK minus one, okay? That's what I meant in this picture. So if I plot my point, it starts from here, goes up, 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 and then it starts doing this run of cutting. But it stops at some point in between, say here. Okay? This could be my orbit for n. And now I just have to understand what are the intervals in this partition. So what are the intervals in this partition and what are the sizes of the intervals in this partition? Do you see the three gap? Um, actually, my picture is very bad because this, what I'm cutting, has the same, sorry, this width should be the same width that the small tower. So, uh, so this, 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 and this have all the same width. And my blue, my blue is doing my usual partition plus this extra run up to some height. So do you see the three gaps in this picture? I don't know, anybody sees? So I want to say that the floors in which my orbit cuts uh, the picture have only three possible lengths. So I need three colors. Okay, so these floors have all the same lengths. But the length of this floor is the same also here. Here. And here. So all of these are gaps of the same length. Okay? What else? Well, these large tower floors, here is an interval of a different length. This is going to be approved by picture. So this is the second gap. So one gap length, second gap length, and the third is that. And this is the third gap length. Uh, these colors don't show very well maybe on the board, but uh, how can I do it? So this is green, this is orange, and everything else was now, did I use twice green? Ah, uh, it doesn't matter. I think I understood. Okay, hopefully. So this is yellow. Uh, third gap. Well, maybe we'll do it. Ah, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you see it's very, very visual. And you, I can now ask you, compute the frequency. What are the lengths of the gaps? What are their values? And what are their frequency? And how often the gap appears? And how often? the length is such, and actually all of this you can compute through the Gauss map, because this would be functions of the continued fraction entries. And you know that the Gauss map is ergodic, it's actually mixing, it's uniquely ergodic, so you can compute the frequency of occurrence of continued fraction values, and this will tell you how often do you see a gap of a certain length. So a lot of fine information about the distribution of gaps can be inferred from ergodic theory of the Gauss map. So you see the power of renormalization in some sense. Okay, and uh, one, one more that I will do in detail, and then I will start hand-waving some words about the rest. So one word, which is another key uh, thing, is the jacques my inequality. So this is the inequality by the jacques one. And again, if any of you studied circle diffeos, uh, you will know of this. So maybe also people in number theory actually use it. Or I'll give you a proof through towers. Okay. So you take a function. This is the theorem about Birkhoff sums. So I take a function from the circle to R, which has mean zero. Uh, And I want to assume that, let's assume that f is uh, C1, differentiable, uh, it's smooth, uh, continuous derivative. So how many people know what bounded variation means? Almost all. So the real assumption, you just need bounded variation. I'm not going to define variation, though. So it's true for functions of bounded variation. 
And then I take my alpha, I say, uh, if you want irrational, let's make it irrational. And QK are the denominators. And I want to study Birkhoff sums. So I asked, indeed, Davide to set the notation SN of F. So let me write SN of F is the nth Birkhoff sum. So I'm summing my function from k from 0 to n minus 1. And I'm evaluating f, uh, the orbit of x. Okay. So we know these are the sums which appear in the ergodic theorem. And we know, uh, or maybe, you know, if you proved, but okay. Uh, irrational rotation are ergodic, actually. Uh, yeah, we proved that they are uniquely ergodic because we, we proved Weil theorem, actually. So we know that Sn of f uh, is actually small o of n. So if I divide by n, it goes to zero. But you can ask, uh, what is this error? How fast does it go to zero? What can I say? And what is really key of the rotation, so sorry, this is uh, aside. This was just to, oh, I, I can leave it, but uh, this is not part of the Jean Coxma. Uh, maybe I'll put it here. In general, Sn is a small o of f, but when n is the denominator, uh, what this says that Sn, Sqk, so there exists a uniform constant such that for every k, as qk of f is uniformly bounded. So in the infinity norm, is less than constant. Okay. So Birkhoff sums are bounded at special times given by denominators. Uh, by curiosity, has anybody seen this, the Jokaksma inequality before? OK, almost nobody. But I can tell you, in many fields, it's really uh, basic, and especially in circle diffuse. And OK, uh, so l l I want to uh, prove it. And uh, well, I will sketch the beginning of the proof. And I want to use towers again. Uh, so first of all, I know that f has integral 0. And if you want, uh, I claim that this implies that the integral of S qn of f is equal to 0. This is just uh, the sum uh, uh, in k up to n minus 1 of the integral of f composed with r alpha to the k. But here I'm just using that this is measure preserving. So actually all these integrals are the same. If you remember the lecture of, did Irene? No, Irene, did you do it? No, that you measure, the rotation preserve, it's just a chain the value for rotation. So these are all zero. So the, in the sum of QN zero integrals is zero. Okay? Okay, so. The integral is zero, so the integral of this Birkhoff sums is zero, and I'm assuming C1 here. The proof for bounded variation has to be slightly different. So this implies that uh, uh, there exists a point, there exists an x zero, such that S Q, sorry, QK, I was calling them, oh, it doesn't matter. Sometimes I call them N, okay. Such that S Q N, of x0 is equal to 0. So I have a point where it's a 0. So it's enough to show. It's enough to show that. Uh, uh, it's enough to show that uh, there exists a constant such that for every x, uh, for every x, if I look at the Birkhoff sum at x, if I look at the difference 
between x and 0. 0 is my origin. Oh, and this is bounded by c. Why is it enough? Why is it enough? Huh? Sorry? Someone said something? No, I'm, I'm, I will use. Uh, I have a point which is, uh, I don't know where this point is, but I have a point where it's zero, and I can compare any point with. Uh, Ah, oh, sorry, maybe, um, yeah, so you want to use that point where it's a zero, but maybe, uh, uh, I, I, I actually, yeah, uh, so I want to say, uh, I want to compare any point, I want, if I can compare any two points, then I can compare, uh, I can, I can compare, for example, uh, I can do like this. I can compare this one with the point. I can add and subtract the point where it's a zero plus. Uh, sorry. Uh, what did I want to say? Um, you can just say this is less than. Uh, uh, no, I have to add and subtract a zero. Sorry. Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> uh, any point can be compared with uh, uh, yeah that's fine Th that's I'm happy no <laughs> now everybody's something good <laughs> I got it to think sorry <laughs> yeah zero should be in the middle you want to compare everything to zero and one is zero that's right that's what I want so I add and subtract uh, ah, yes, yes. Uh, I add a sub, thank you. <laughs> I add and subtract zero, and here I put x zero. So, so I want to write like this. So, s, uh, is it right? S q n of f of x is equal to, I'm adding and subtracting zero, and this by definition is the point for which is zero. So, everything is equal. So, this is zero, this is added and subtracting, and this is less than, uh, no. And yeah, and these two are, bo are less than 2c. Okay? Happy? Okay. If I can compare every two points, to, then I can compare with my zero point. Okay? I can compare everything with zero, so okay? So how do I compare uh, with zero? So the picture, I want to use my towers. So I'm going to look at the k towers because I'm going for height uh, Q, no, uh, n towers, because I'm going for height Qn. So this is Qn, and this is Qn minus 1. And I know where the orbit of 0 is. So this is the orbit of 0, of length Qn. Okay? And I don't know where my point x is, say that it's here. You have actually to discuss two cases, the big tower, and the, it could be in the big tower or in the small tower. And I will only do the big tower, which is actually easier. But Say that my point is here. And what does it do? It goes up, and then it comes back. Uh, it's the length of the orbit is Qn. So I go up, and then I come back and get to reach the same height when I do Qn. Maybe let's do it in a different color, like orange. So, and the claim is that for every, for every, let's say, xi, which belongs to the orbit of x up to qn, I can find there is a yi, which belongs to the orbit of zero. Y i, which belongs to the orbit of zero up to a height q n. Maybe it's all q n minus one. 
So I can, I can pair points of the blue orbit with points of the red orbit so that, uh, so that x xi and yi uh, belong to the same floor, to the same floor, and uh, so, the, so that the interval, let's say that the interval between, made by xi and yi belong to the same floor, and, and they are all these joints. So let me show you. I think it's more clear if I show you an example. And so let me just show. I just want to pair them like this. For every orange point here, I pair it with the neighboring blue point on the same floor. And here, too, I pair them with the blue point. It's a little farther away, but it doesn't matter. So this will be an xi, and this will be the corresponding yi. This will be an xj. This will be the corresponding yj. So you see all these intervals are disjoint. OK? And then I'm done. Then I can write sqn f of x minus sqn f of 0 up to rearranging the order of the points. This is equal to the sum from 0 to qn minus 1 of f of xi minus f of yi. Okay, because each point is paired with another point, and I can rearrange my sum like this. You see? And, and we are done. So now I want to use, so if you know what bounded variation means, now you can use bounded variation. If not, you can just use that this is less than the sum up to q1 of the integral uh, from xi to yi of the derivative. Uh, uh, and you can bring the integral inside f prime in dx. So this difference, I just use that it's the less than the integral of the derivative. And this interval are disjoint, and this is where I use it. So this is less than the integral of the derivative on the circle. And the function is integrable, so this is integrable. This is, well, it's continuous, so this is a, uh, it's a finite constant. OK? So if you know the definition of variation, you can replace actually here the variation of f. This is actually less than the variation of f. OK? So this is a nice proof. I haven't finished the proof. There is this other case, and I think I'm running out of time, so I, I, I may give you an exercise with a hint to how to do the small tower case. But hopefully, I gave you two proofs which use the towers, which you can, which kind of gave you an intuition of why towers are, are useful. And, and from the Jacques-Oxma, you can also study, if you, can, if you want to study Birkhoff sums of a rotation for a function, you can actually, uh, for other n, you can decompose n into uh, this QKs. Uh, this is, I'm not telling you how to do it, but uh, there is a way of writing other n's as a combination of the QK and the IK. And then you can bound Birkhoff sums of at other times with something like constant times the sum of the AK up to this kn. And this kn you, is actually less than log n. Uh, so basically what you can prove is that uh, you can kind of study how fast or how slow Birkhoff sums grow for other points and prove that they have some bounds which are uh, logarithmic and you can do very fine information on deviations over ergodic averages, they are called, or discrepancies. So, and again, here you see then, for other ends, the entry of the continuous fraction play a role. And that's where the Gauss map and the ergodic theory of the Gauss map will give you, again, a lot of information. So at special times, at QK, QN, everything is bounded. 
And at other times, you can use the Gauss map and continuous fraction to help you out to say non-trivial things. So I always forget at what time did I start? Huh? So I, I have like five minutes, something like this. So now I will just, uh, uh, I will show you what, uh, 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 what did I want to show you? So uh, I will not tell you about, uh, about uh, uh, I thought I would tell you something about what do you do when you have a diffeomorphism or a homeomorphism. And uh, if you are interested, you can chat with me. Uh, separately, but if you have F, which is uh, not, now not a rotation, but a diffeomorphism, you can actually uh, look at something like the point zero and F of zero. You can cut your circle and F of zero, and you can actually do very similar algorithm. So you can start looking at images of this interval. Let's call it delta one. And you can, the image of this interval will be f of zero is here. f square of zero will be there. So your interval will map, it will not have the same length when it maps here, but so you, then you will have at some point f cube of zero, dot, 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 until some f a zero of zero. So somehow you, the images of this interval don't have the same length, but they come next to each other from the left. So and this will be kind of the reminder. You can call it delta, what is it, delta two. So you, I want to say that you can do this exactly the same algorithm for homeomorphisms. And through this, you can actually find something called the rotation number and indeed prove some basic results. So I will not, I will skip this slide because I had put a slide where I told you uh, some Poincaré theorem, then Joie and Hermann. And I just wanted to say that all these theorems you can prove with the, the different version of this algorithm. But I'll skip it. And I'll just conclude the last two minutes. I really don't want to explain this, but I want to show you. This is a slice from a talk that I gave. It's a result that we proved with Michael maybe a year ago, which now uh, was published. Uh, um, uh, in another Poincaré, but it's okay. It's a, it's a recent research. It's about uh, rotations, really real rotations. And uh, it's about the central limit here. So again, I'm not showing you this because you, I want to explain it really, but I want to just give you a flavor. So we look at really the rotation, and we look at the function which is a piecewise constant. It's the characteristic function on an interval made mean zero. And we plot Birkhoff sums, so we can use this function and the rotation to, uh, to, to walk, to have a walk on 0, 1 cross r. So what do I, take a point and plot what happens when I rotate it by alpha and add the function. So as my point move, I record the values of my function and add them up on the real line. So I do rotation, and then I add the value of the function at that point. So I rotate, and I add the value of the function at the point where I am. So I can plot and get kind of a walk, like a kind of a random walk. So I plot, and I record where I am, and add the function which will move me up or down. So this is kind of a walk dri driven by a rotation. And now you can ask, uh, basically, the, 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 uh, the values of the Birkhoff sums of the function over the rotation tell you how high I am on the real line. And then you can start asking, well, how is this random walk distributed? How much time do I spend at a certain height when I move? And you can define kind of an occupancy variable. So I fix some height, AB, some strip, and I record how many times I enter this strip in time n and divide by n. So this is like the distribution. I can get a random variable which tells me how much time I spent at each height. And uh, OK, when alpha is a quadratic irrational and the jump is at 1 half, you can prove that you can normalize this random variable. And in the limit, you see a Gaussian. So it's a, this is kind of a central limit theorem. I don't know how many people did probability. I'm not going. And Dolgopiat and Sarig recently extended this back theorem uh, uh, 
uh, to any rational, any initial point. And the recent paper that we have with Michael Bromberg is about uh, proving this is the, the real the statement. So look at the Birkel sums. You can center them and normalize them so that this uh, time that you spent in a strip converge to a Gaussian. It's a central limit theorem for the rotation. And maybe you are not surprised, but rota in, in hyperbolic system, central limit theorem are very common. But in entropy zero system, it's hard to see the central limit theorem. And here you see it, but you see it on a logarithmic scale. And it's a trace of the Gauss map and the hyperbolicity of the Gauss map that you see. But OK, it's not so important the result. I want to tell you there are still non-trivial things you can prove about rotations. But let me tell you what are the, this is a slide from the talk. I didn't change it. Tools in the proof, renormalization. We use the classical algorithm by Gauss, actually an extension of this Gauss map which produces the continuous fraction, you know that, and then there's an extension which produces the Ostrowski expansion. Okay, and we use a symbolic tall decoding using the towers, and then we use a central limit theorem for Markov chains. Okay, let me show you the next slide. Do you recognize this slide? So you have an interval, and you start cutting from the left and cutting from the right. This is our algorithm, and you have a reminder. And uh, then, okay, you record the position of the jump beta in this algorithm, and then you renormalize. And here I was flipping and renormalizing. And uh, you get the continuous fraction, and you get the Ostrowski expansion. And I'll show you this is the last slide. Look here. Do you recognize anything? We use the towers of, for the rotation, you have two towers. Here we cut the tower at the position of the mark point, and we do, look, we do cutting and stacking. <laughs> <laughs> and this cutting and stacking, then we use it to code uh, the dynamics of the rotation through the towers and so and so and so on. This, I think I this is really taken from my talk. So, and you get, uh, you get the Markov measure on symbolic shifts and then you use the theorem for Markov chains. So I just wanted to convince you that I'm still using what I learned as a PhD student and what I taught you <laughs> yesterday. Okay, so this is the end of the class. So. Next week, we'll see more renormalization in, other, uh, in another context. Have a good weekend.